Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. This week, we're sharing audio from anarchist prisoner in the UK, Toby Schoen. Toby was arrested in November of 2020 after a car chase and during five simultaneous raids on residences in the Forest of Dean outside of Bristol. Toby was accused of being responsible for the insurrectionary counter-info anarchist site 325.nostate.net, as well as a participant in the Informal Anarchist Federation International Revolutionary Front, FAI-IRF, for authoring communiques on behalf of that group as well as the Earth Liberation Front for funding terrorism and being involved in the sabotage of a cell phone tower and having information on explosives. This raid and the case were brought in conjunction with an attempted linking of a diverse array of UK anarchist projects with terrorist charges via so-called Operation A Dream, which Toby understands to be conducted in conjunction with intelligence services from the Netherlands and Germany. The court failed to convict Toby Schoen on these charges and only succeeded in convicting him of having and distributing hallucinogens, for which he got three years and nine months. Toby was then rearrested while out on probation for having a cell phone and attending a prisoner support event. So you'll hear two audios from Toby. First, him explaining his conviction and situation during his first incarceration. And then you'll hear Toby recently answer a few questions from us and updating listeners about his recent re-imprisonment at HMP Garth, far away from his supporters in the Bristol area. Much thanks to Brighton Anarchist Black Cross, for supporting Toby and this conversation, and more info can be found at brightonabc.org.uk. Also, Toby's supporters have noted that he's been receiving some pretty spotty treatment for his cancer and not getting a healthy vegan diet, and so has lost some weight of recent. His mail, including letters and books, haven't been making their way to him at HMP Garth, so it's been requested that supporters consider writing Toby postcards, letters, or email in order to help him through these next seven or eight months left before scheduled release, and also to inform his crew via the email address forestcase at riseup.net that you've been sending him stuff in case he doesn't get it, just so they have notes for the lawyers. Notably, at the website of Brighton ABC, you'll find information about an upcoming international anti-repression gathering happening in Brighton from March 30th to 31st. And there's information there about signing up for the event as well. Then we were able to get an interview with Nicolas of Buenos Aires, Argentina, to catch up on what's been happening since the presidential election of libertarian capitalist Javier Malay. Malay's presidential campaign was highlighted by his claims to subvert the status quo of Peronism, a socially liberal form of populist democracy with decades of complicated contexts throughout the 20th century. He's claimed to be a, uh, quote, anarcho-capitalist, unquote, although his policies since election have been nothing short of classical neoliberalism. Cuts to social welfare, hamstringing of labor unions' rights to strike and picket, and doing away with common regulations of capital. While Americans have sought to understand Malay by comparing him to former U.S. President Trump, Nicholas outlines how this comparison falls short. We also talk about the role of organized anti-fascists in expecting continued clashes with the police, the social space and boxing gym La Cultura del Barrio, and how the call for a general strike by mainstream labor unions in Argentina largely fell flat. But first, I'd like to share a few brief announcements. For folks who hear this in time, you're invited to mourn the death of Aaron Bushnell, anarchist and U.S. soldier who self-immolated on February 25th in front of the Israeli embassy in D.C. to protest the U.S. complicity in and arming of the Israeli genocidal war on Palestinians. This gathering will happen at 6.30 p.m. on Sunday, February 3rd, by the Craven Street Bridge over the French Broad River in Asheville. Next up, Rashid, Minister of Defense of the Intercommunal Black Panther Party, has surpassed the 70th day of his hunger strike demanding transfer to a lower security medical facility near where he can receive comprehensive treatment for his prostate cancer, and he is suffering dire medical consequences as his organs begin to shut down. You can hear an interview that we did with Shipavu Wakarima of the IRBPP on the earlier stages of this hunger strike from January 21st, uh, linked in our show notes. 
But there's a sample script and some numbers for you to call that you can find in our show notes as well um, to try to advocate on behalf of Rashid to Virginia government authorities to save this man's life. Next up, Mumia Abu Jamal, longtime political prisoner, former Black Panther, supporter of the Move organization, underwent a double bypass heart surgery on April 19th of 2021. His doctors prescribed a cardiac diet and regular exercise for recovery. To this date, almost three years later, the prison has failed to provide Mumia with required cardiac diet and opportunities for exercise. More of this, including places you can donate to his legal and medical defense fund and who to express your concerns to for Mumia's life and safety can be found at prisonradio.org or linked in our show notes. Finally, elder political prisoner of Lakota, Dakota, and Anishinaabe descent, Leonard Peltier, has been in prison for roughly 47 years and at nearly 80 years old after this long behind bars, his physical physical health is ailing. His supporters are asking people of conscience to contact U.S. senators and representatives to appeal for medical care for his eyesight and other medical needs, including his access to a wheelchair. There are lots of backgrounds on this case, but you can find a February 17th, 2019 interview that we did with Paulette Dato, uh, linked in our show notes on his case. Um, and in our show notes, you'll also find a sample script and some people to reach out to in positions of power to, again, request basic medical support for an elder who is being um, killed in U.S. prisons. Thank you, and onwards with the show. My name is Toby Schoen, and I am an imprisoned anarchist held in Bristol Prison who was kidnapped in gunpoint by the anti-terrorist unit as part of Operation A Dream in UK. The repression was aimed to target the anarchist group of Critique and Praxis, 325 Collective, and the website 325.nostate.net. Operation A Dream is an attack by the British state in conjunction with European partners against anarchist direct action groups, counter-information projects, prisoner solidarity initiatives, and the new anarchist critique of the technological singularity and the fourth and fifth industrial revolution. Operation Dream is the first time that anti-terrorist legislation has been used against the anarchist movement in the UK. I was taken hostage by the regime on the 18th of November 2020 by a team of tactical firearms cops after a car chase through the remote forest of Dean, which is on the border with South Wales, one hour north of Bristol. At the same time, coordinated raids took place at five addresses in the forest of Dean against collective living projects, hangouts and a storage unit. I was taken under armed guard to a nearby police station where I was held in communicado and interrogated many, many times. I refused to speak during the interrogations and I did not cooperate with the murderers in uniform. I was charged with four counts of terrorism, one charge of Section 2, dissemination of terrorist publications as a suspected administrator 325.nostate.net Two charges of Section 58 Possession of information useful for the purposes of terrorism Those being two videos one of which showed how to improvise an explosive shaped charge and the other demonstrated how to burn down a mobile phone transmitter I was charged with Section 15 Funding Terrorism which was related to cryptocurrency wallets hosted on 325.nostate.net, which were for the support of anarchist prisoners and publications. I denied all the charges. I was also accused during the interrogations of membership of FI, IRF, the Informal Anarchist Federation, International Revolutionary Front. I was accused of writing five documents and carrying out several actions in the Bristol area, which were claimed by cells of the five, as well as those of the Earth and Animal Liberation Fronts. These included an incendiary attack against a police station. The 
burning down of a mobile phone transmitter and liberation of animals. Bristol is an area of UK where there have been countless anarchist sabotages and direct actions taking place over the last two decades and which remain unsolved by police despite multi-million pound investigations and joint media witch hunts against anarchists in the city. From the collective spaces and hangouts that were raided during Operation Adreen, the cops seized hundreds of copies of 325 number 12 magazine, dozens of anarchist pamphlets, books, stickers, posters and flyers, laptops, mobile phones, printers, hard drives, cameras, radio frequency jammers, GPS units, smoke, noise and flash charges, replica firearms and cash. In the evidence produced against me was numerous anarchist publications, including 325 number 12 magazine, which is about the fourth and fifth industrial revolution. The pamphlet, Incendiary Dialogues, by Gustavo Rodriguez, Gabriel Pombo da Silva, and Alfredo Cospito, which is published by Black International Editions. Also the text, What is Anarchism, by Alfredo Bonanno, Dark Knight's newsletter, the small book, Anarchy, Civil or Subversive, by 325 and Dark Matter Publications, a flyer in solidarity with anarchist prisoners, Alfredo Cospito, Nicola Guy, a flyer against the COVID-19 lockdowns called Face the Fear, Fight the Future, as well as many other texts and publications in solidarity with anarchist prisoners and revolutionary organizations such as the CCF, Conspiracy of Cells of Fire. I was remanded to Wandsworth Prison in London after appearing at Westminster Magistrates Court and held under anti-terrorist conditions. I was denied to make any phone call in the prison for 10 days, as well as a similar embargo on my mail. I was denied to see my lawyers for six weeks, 23 and a half hour solitary confinement with sometimes up to 48 hours without being able to leave the cell for anything other than to collect a meal. No yard time for the first three weeks and then only allowed to go outside on the yard once a fortnight for 35 minutes. No gym, no library, no education, no activities. I was held in a dungeon-like cell with no natural light and subjected to deafeningly loud construction noise as I was placed by the counter-terror unit next to a new section of the prison being built. My letters, phone calls and associations all subject to routine monitoring and censorship with constant obstruction to access for my lawyers, post and books. I did not receive the full case against me for many, many months. Operation A Dream is a montage fitting together disparate, unconnected elements typical of repressive operations in southern Europe, which has spread across the continent. This is now being deployed by the British police. Operation Dream seeks to present the conspiracy of cells of fire as a continuation of the armed Marxist-Leninist revolutionary organization, November the 17th. This is an important fantasy for the purposes of repression in this operation as November the 17th is a prescribed group in the UK. Most importantly, Operation Adream sought to present the diverse range of anarchist groups, publishing projects and prisoner support initiatives as an array of organisational hubs for the execution and glorification of terrorism. The case was authorised by the Director of Public Prosecutions Max Hill, QC. The investigation revealed at least the participation of Dutch and German cops, the hidden hand of the security services and an international dimension to the operation, 
based on previous waves of repression in Spain, Italy and Greece was evident. During my interrogations, I was being asked a pre-written script of questions, which, for instance, not even the detectives appeared to understand why I was being asked, as the entire operation was a marionette guided by others to achieve a political purpose. About that, I can only quote the murdered anarchist Bartholomew Vanzetti, who remarked, the higher of them, the more jackass. It is certainly appropriate, as on the 6th of October 2021, at Bristol Crown Court, I was found not guilty. However, I was condemned for the possession and supply of Class A and B narcotics, the psychedelic medicines, LSD, DMT, psilocybin, MDMA and marijuana, as these were all seized from the collective spaces. I was sentenced to three years, nine months. I'm also fighting against a serious organized crime prevention order, which is demanded by the anti-terrorist unit and the prosecutors. The order would put me under a form of house arrest for up to five years when I finally get released, with a punishment of up to five years if I breach the order. The order would control and monitor my daily movements, contact with others, residents, usage of money, devices, international travel, and so on. It demands precise information be given to the cops of all my friends, contacts, and loved ones. And it's simply a means to monitor and criminalize my friendship and living environments. My trial for that is scheduled no earlier than the 15th of January, and the investigation against me continues, as does Operation A Dream, which is aimed at the 325 Collective. I want to thank all those who have supported me. My heart is open and strong, and I am determined. I send to you all a huge hug and a smile. This is the final straw of radio, and you just heard anarchist prisoner Toby Schoen talking in 2022 about his prosecution and incarceration in the UK. Next up, Toby answers a few questions from us and speaks about his recent rearrest and the current state of his capture. More on Toby's case can be found at brightonabc.org.uk. We're speaking with Toby Schoen, anarchist currently incarcerated in Garth Prison in Leyland. Thank you so much for being willing to have this conversation. Hi, Final Straw Radio. It's Toby. I want to thank you for this opportunity and express my gratitude for the anarchist Black Cross Brighton for facilitating. Prior to this conversation, we played your statement from 2022 about your initial case and imprisonment in order to give some background to your situation in your own words. The Brighton ABC website describes your arrest, your re-arrest, while on release to a halfway house. But I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing what happened to you and where you are now. I was transferred to the long-term high security prison estate in October 2023 after a firework solidarity demo for my case outside where I was previously locked up in Bristol prison. I'm currently in a cell on Sea Wing, Garth Prison in Northwest UK. We're around 850 men in this prison the majority of which are on very long sentences or life. It's a brutal and unforgiving environment, but my heart is strong and I'm as stubborn as ever and I remain unrepentant and anarchist to the end. I was arrested last year in September by a tactical unit acting under command of the South West Counter-Terror Police. I've spent nine months in conditional liberty after release under MAPA multi-agency public protection arrangements. The National Security Division classified me as dangerous and posing a high risk of serious harm to the general public and the state. To justify my arrest, the Counter-Terror Police and National Security Division indicate my abject refusal to cooperate with them, possession of an unauthorized smartphone, 
and attendance at Prisoner Solidarity Dinner at Base Anarchist Social Centre in Eastern Bristol as part of the International Week of Solidarity with Anarchist Prisoners, which takes place every year from August 23rd till 30th. In your explanation of the case that we played before, you spoke about Operation A Dream, the raids in your community, the terrorism charges, accusations of responsibility for publishing dangerous materials, and the attempt to link you and other comrades and projects to international struggles and illegal activities. The Crown prosecutors failed at convicting, convincing the courts, and following that, failed to successfully impose a serious crime prevention order, SCPO that would have not only further limited your association and travel, but had the purpose of social mapping your relationships and hopes of wrangling you back into prison sooner. Could you speak about the continued political pursuit of you by the UK law enforcement under the guise of criminality since they couldn't get you on politics? Or is that an inappropriate distinction for me to make? About the continued investigation, little is known. Other than the investigative report served that detailed the intense surveillance I was under during my conditional liberty. So far, there have been no more raids, only harassment and monitoring, including a notable border detention and attempted interrogation under the counter-terror schedule seven legislation of a close comrade returning from Barcelona some time ago. As anarchists and those engaged in revolutionary struggle, we can expect ongoing, undefined, continuous surveillance and pursuit. In this, social and political crimes are merely expedient reasonings for state agencies towards their aim of neutralizing their enemies. It's clear that I, along with other comrades, have been under investigation for many years, and even now, within the prison walls, I remain under enhanced close monitoring and the attempted disruption of my contact with those outside none of which will suppress my insurrectional speech and the transmission of the anarchic ideas. All the investigative reports, surveillance logs, and counter-terror analytics are worthless trash composed by the human garbage of the state. In addition to the contents of that January 2022 statement, have there been any revelations concerning Operation A Dream or similar coordinated law enforcement attacks on anarchists and libertarians in the UK? It's known that police coordination, including that of cross-border cooperation, exists. But again, little is known definitively at present. But what is more important is our coordination, our international struggle, the next generation of social war, against the state, capitalism, and the technological singularity. Towards this networking, we propose an international anti-prisons gathering in Brighton, March 29th to the 31st of this year. This event is only the first part of a renewed set of encounters to support our imprisoned comrades and the struggle against the prison industrial complex. Secondly, we propose an international anti-technology gathering to take place in an as yet unconfirmed city in mainland Europe in the autumn of 2025. The details of this meeting will be available at the end of this year. Aside from the coordination of practical encounters, we can also mention the cross-pollination and blossoming of our struggle in the streets for which no police coordination has yet been able to prevent nor destroy, and the days and nights belong to us. Would you please tell us about the current condition of your confinement, access to exercise, books, lawyers, and your supporters, including the impacts of moving you so far from home and your main support network? I'm basically locked up for 22 and a half hours every day in a very small cell. As to my access to books, very difficult due to the conditions I'm subject to, to receive them. I've been denied over seven books already, and it's the same with my correspondence, which is heavily censored. I receive very little. The strategy of the National Security Division is based on trying to prevent me from perceiving social support and isolating me from that support. To that end, I was moved to the long-term high security prison estate. 
evidently it's a pathetic and failed repressive move which only makes me more determined and steadfast in my outlook and my perspectives. I welcome cards and letters and I reply to each one that I receive. You can also contact Anarchist Black Cross Brighton to send me greetings or to stay in touch. I'm in weekly contact with my excellent legal team and we're working on a parole application. I doubt I'll be released before my sentence end date. I have yard time each day for 30 minutes and I have access to the gym twice a week. Another huge concern for folks that are incarcerated is healthcare, and it seems pertinent to ask you about that since what the state was able to convict you for were the drugs that you were treating yourself with. On January 22nd, Outside Comrades published a letter of yours talking about endangerment and indecencies that you've experienced with your cancer and oncology treatment. How is your health and what's the status of the medical care that you are able to receive? As many of you know, I'm in remission from cancer and it's been a difficult journey that some of you also face or will face. And for prisoners, healthcare usually does not exist. There's a response team for drug overdoses and suicide attempts, for the aftermath of fights, stabbings and beatings. But in my experience, there is no effective health care in the prison system in the UK. There is only neglect and the endorsement of the prison's torture. Generally, the conditions are very bad and health care is mostly a racket for the widespread issuing of drugs to keep prisoners compliant and addicted to opiates and psychiatric medication. Could you speak about your experiences with other prisoners or any lessons you've taken away from your time resisting repression or while you were held in prison that could be helpful or insightful for me or other currently outside audience members? I've always enjoyed really good relationships with the other imprisoned guys on the whole. Prison might be a horrific, dehumanizing and violent place, but your life will continue inside. You'll find a way to live meaningfully if you keep your head up and stay positive. You hold on to your dreams. What many folks on the outside don't realize is that they also live in a prison, a social prison, and those who risk nothing gain nothing. So never let your fear control you, inside or out. In your heart, nurture your strength and your kindness. If you want a better world, prison is where you may end up. And this is worthwhile of respect. And the revolutionary path has always had losses. But we can use each day to learn, to laugh, to keep ourselves supple, and to fill our inner life with wonder. Here we are behind enemy lines and we are on a war footing. Listen more than you speak. Keep yourself clean and well fed. Don't fraternize with screws or snitches. Don't become involved in gossip, debt, or the black market economy. Go to the gym, get your food, get out on the yard, maintain your routines and your interests. Only you can give away your dignity and your self-respect, and no one can take it from you. Life does not enter. Life does not end when you enter the gate. Would you like to say anything about the support networks that have spread your word, reached into you to contact you, and have acted or spoken in solidarity with you from the outside? I want to express my solidarity with every comrade locked up in prison and send an embrace to all those in the support networks. All the nameless translators and agitators, to the international groups of the Anarchist Black Cross and the countless groups and individuals who are active, to the Forest Case, the Dark Nights, to our chaotic project, to the Western Alps Anti-Repression Fund, many thanks. A revolutionary movement can be assessed by the extent to which it takes care of its captured fighters to the extent it continues the struggle. What I want to emphasize is the restructuring of a global network of resistance, which has the destruction of prisons and the state at its core. 
in this that everyone can play their role in the ways they choose. I want to speak of the need to re-establish an Atlantic bridge of comradeship, affinity and social war. And I want to stress the importance of the struggle against the new industrial revolutions and the singularity to come. I'm with you when you put pen to paper for our imprisoned comrades. I'm with you at the benefit dinner, at the solly gig, at the demonstration, at the occupations and evictions, at the barricades when stones and fire rain from the skies, when the fear changes sides. I'm there with you all because our struggle is one. With a hug, a helping hand and a raised fist, I'm beside you. So you're scheduled to be released on November 11th, 2024, four years after your initial arrest. Do you have any post-relief support that you need, do you want a mention, that you want to mention where folks can throw some money or help you transition out of prison? Yes, I'm scheduled for release on the 11th of November this year, but we cannot rule out the megalomania and dirty tricks of the British regime, which I've already been threatened with recently. I expect to remain under surveillance and harassment by the National Security Division and counter-terror police, and this will also affect the comrades around me. We lost two out of three collective living spaces as a result of the raids in November 2020 and incurred substantial losses. The Forest case does not concern me solely, and I can't forget about those on the other side of the walls, those under investigation and hunted. If you want to contribute to the Anti-Repression Solidarity Fund for Operation Adreen, please contact Anarchist Black Cross Brighton on brightonabc at riseup.net or the Solidarity Group Forest Case at riseup.net. Thank you again, Final Straw Radio. Initiatives like this break the imposed isolation and help us prisoners to escape the walls and the barbed wire that separates us. I've tried to answer your questions as best as I can, and any errors in interpretation and dictation are mine. This is Toby Schoen, Anarchist and Chaotic, signing off. Thanks all for listening. Ciao. This is the Final Straw Radio on the Pacifica Network, and you just heard our chat with imprisoned anarchist Toby Schoen at HMP Garth in the UK. If you appreciate the work we do here at The Final Straw, please consider a one-time or recurring donation or merch purchase via the links at tfsr.wtf support. Or if you join up on our Patreon for a monthly donation of $3 or more a month, a month, you'll have access to early episodes and other goodies. The money that we take in goes to pay our transcribers so that this info can go further, get translated, end up on the internet for people to sample and cut from, gets mailed into prisoners, uh, and generally more easily shared around as zines. We're a little behind on our operating costs, honestly, at the moment. So if you haven't kicked in in a while or ever and are on the fence, please consider donating. And to those of you that are, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. It's really appreciated. If you want to support the show in other ways, you can rate and review the show on podcasting platforms. You can spread the word to your friends in person or via social media. Or if you live in an area with community radio, you can check out the radio tab at our website and we'll help you to see if a local radio station will play our free weekly show. Now you'll hear a conversation about the recent demonstrations and repression around austerity measures from President Javier Malay in Argentina, as well as the anti-fascist gym and cultural space La Cultura del Barrio in Buenos Aires. More info, a longer version of this chat, and show notes up at our website, tfsr.wtf. First, if you could just introduce yourself and uh, some of the projects you work on in Buenos Aires. Well, my name is Nicolas. I'm from the southeast city of the country. I'm living in... Buenos Aires since I'm 2009, and I'm, a, I'm part of Acción Antifascista Buenos Aires, Antifascist Action from here. Just, well, that's, that's me. If you have any more questions. I, yeah, I think uh, I'd be excited to talk about 
LCDB, uh, La Cultura del Barrio, but um, yes. but uh, maybe we can talk about that. There's a, a later in the interview as, as well. But let's let's kind of jump in. So for uh, you know English speaking American audiences who who maybe don't follow Argentine politics very closely, Millet is just recently elected and. The most of what I feel like has been talked about in U.S. media is that he's he's kind of the the Argentina version of of our Donald Trump. So I'm curious if you could maybe you know who is Millet and you know, kind of just talk about how did he become popular enough to win the presidential election? Like what was his mass appeal? Yeah, uh, well, Millet is a very new phenomenon. It's not like Trump. I think Trump is like more uh, patriotic, if you want. Millet, it uh, appeals like to a kind of freedom speak idea, but in the fact that the fact he's trying to apply like not a liberal policy, but a illiberal policy, because he's uh, he have a liberal. Uh, speak a liberal discourse. I don't know how to say discourse. I don't remember discourse. Yeah. Um, but trying to apply all the the, the policies by a, a decree. You know, for example, the last month they as government try to apply a decreto de necesidad urgencia, a necessary urgency decree to apply like seven hundred laws without discussing it in the Congress. Uh, it includes uh, privatize the football club, for example, um, giving him the right to apply laws without the Congress for two years, manage the economics and social policies without the Congress. Obviously, the, the left-wing parties on the, or the social democrat parties say, stop, we can go, with, we go on with it. So a lot of people which vote him also noted that that's not why we vote you, you know? Like you were talking about liberty, freedom, about a free market, etc. cetera, uh, taking out the subsidy, uh, the benefits from the poorest people, but he didn't do anything of that, but he moved the money from the poorest uh, classes to the richest, the subs uh, subsidies. I don't know if the same when the government could give money to a private company. He started with that, with a very big companies like Mercado Libre. It's like the Amazon of Argentina, like reducing taxes for another companies, big companies, but the smallest companies not. About the the protest, the demonstrations, the first one, the big, the biggest one, was uh, three weeks ago, organized by the biggest union syndicates, you know, the Confederación General del Trabajo. It's like the the mix of 20, 30 syndicates, uh, unions, but they were they are driving by uh, three persons with, they are very, very rich people. They are in the same charge, in the same uh, presidency of the union, like for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. So they have a lot of power too. Well, they used, well, they uh, organized that, that demonstration. It was like half a million people around the country but it was like one day for two for two three hours and that's all and then when the congress tried to apply the dnl dnu the decree a lot of people goes out to, to the streets and there was like uh some fights against the police or against even the same organizations but then the government get down the the, the decree because a lot of people that in the in the Congress that said to him to the government that they will vote for that, and the last time they didn't do it. 
So the government says, well, we will do in a month, two months, the rotation, the, the vote again, to vote again. So we are waiting for what's going to happen. Yeah. So you said, you talked about how uh, there's like a lot, there's a big kind of feeling among Argentine voters who are saying, this is not why we voted for you. Like you're doing things that we didn't think that you would yeah. do. What, do you have an idea or a feeling of why people voted for Millet? Like, why was he popular? If, for example, as popular is because the social media has been growing like for the last five years in social media, mostly in the younger people. Uh, also, the, another candidate was the economics ministry. And we have, you have to know that that ministry leads the government with uh, 180 percent of uh, inflation. Inflation, I don't know how you say. Inflation, yeah. So the people didn't want to vote that ministry. You know, if we are good voting to a better, better candidate to a better government, you can vote the government that leaves you with your salary, like. Nothing like also the Millet was talking about uh, in the campaign the people who which got the streets to make demonstrations and here in Buenos Aires it's a daily thing you know every day we have a uh, piquete is, as we say is when the people cut the the streets so you can go on and you have to see the, the demonstration. A lot of workers uh, are tired of that because they have to go to the work and they can go because they can go f along the street or they saw a lot of people that didn't work but have uh, some benefits from the state. So a lot of people don't don't like it. That um, Amile and Mele, I think for myself as. Um, he used to shout a lot, you know, oh, screaming a lot in the courses. And the, the, for example, the left wing parties, they are very correct, political correct. So the most part of the workers don't want to be politically correct. They want the things done. Um, he, he used that to, to warn a lot of people, a poorest people, you know, saying well if you if uh for example the politics don't work we don't pay them if the politics uh, have a lot of money we will uh, reduce their salaries uh, they have they talk a lot about the establishment no? you know the, the la casta about for example how the the previous governments had a lot of people working in the different city states of the state different uh, organizations, uh, ministers, etc. And a lot of people saying, saying like, well, I'm paying taxes for to pay a lot of politics, politics or people with doesn't even work. Malay, I think it's, that was the best, uh, the best, no, the, the more, most influential part of the, his discourse. Also, as, he claimed to be like a messiah, you know, uh, the guy who will come to Argentina to save the, the country, choked by his, by his uh, dead dog. He said that he choked with his dead dog. Uh, also, he cloned his dead dog and created four or five more dogs with the same name. He said that a medium and his dog saved him that he gonna save Argentina. And the people didn't even say, well, you're fucking crazy. You're talking with your dog, you know? But no, no, the people, oh, oh his dog, oh yeah, his dog, he's, he's so sweet. He talks with his dead dog, you know? But um, nowadays I think the people, a lot of people who vote him, they're saying, well, well, we have to give him some time to go around, to apply the policies, and we will see in a year. But the people are can't, now can't even pay the public transport, you know? 
uh, we have an um, uh, aument a grown of the price around 100 and 150 percent from a dollar to a three dollars the ticket you know so the people say well not only you are not taking the money from the politics or the big companies but also you are growing the the, the price of the ticket you know and so it's a very weird candidate good person you know it's it's a, it's a freak he's like the last month he were it's dating with a famous actress and he went to the theater to see her and kissing each other in the scenario you know in front of the camera it's like oh and all the people think that's gross you know it's, you're a president you have to be like more serious but no what i don't i don't uh, i can't understand why i understand why he won the the, the elections by but not no why do people love him yeah so it sounds like we you, you we can't really characterize or like describe Millet's supporters as fascists or or members no, of the far no. right. Very far from them. Yeah, it it seems like he has very mass appeal, and that mass appeal came from people being upset with the status yeah. quo of Peronism. Is that true? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, the people the more. Even, for example, the, a lot of fas fascist organizations, fascist groups, or like, they're now, they're not even fascist, you know? They transform into a kind of alt-right alt or a new nationalist, but not fascist. For example, a lot of fascist organizations doesn't like him because he's uh, pro-Israel. Also, he's talking with Fondo Monetario Internacional, the Monetary International Fund, to take a new loan, to pay debts, you know? No, the, the voters are not fascists. They are like all people like upset with their parents, as you say, and looking for a, a new kind of for government, a new kind of discourse, of, uh, uh, and even another kind of discussion in the streets about politics. Because, the, um, for example, the feminist, progressism, uh, ecology was a very big part of the agenda of, of the last government, and a lot of people didn't like it too. But because there was a lot of money from the state going to that kind of organizations, while the people have salaries like from $10, $100 per month, uh, the people say, well, why we have to support the government? which gives a lot of money from to a ex organization for example and not for us so i think that was a very big part of why he wanted to he was upset with that kind of politics yeah that makes a lot of sense so it sounds like the alt right the fascist scene is kind of they're also displeased with millet but for different reasons because as you were saying yeah. his support for israel Far right, have they shifted their style or the ideology in response to Millet, or are they are they just kind of ignoring him? Like, what? How has Millet's presidency impacted the the far right? There's like two sides. One side support him because uh, they want money, I think. Um, the other side, it's like between ignore him and between against uh, some policies, some politics, but supporting another, you know? Far right in Argentina, it's a very little part of the population. They're not uh, big, not with like the 80s or 70s, the far right organizations were a lot, were much bigger than, than now. But nowadays they pass like to social democracy right, you know? <laughs> middle right organizations but for example one of the most notorious discourses of Millet was saying that the pope is the representative of the demon in the earth wow so well then he he said sorry to the pope and 
Jay, he was in the Vaticano like a week ago with the Pope. Um, before that, he was in Israel. So it was like first with the Israel, jet with the Vatican, and we are all happy. For example, in Argentina, I have a lot of uh, shoe population. The Jewish organization here are so with a lot of power because they are a lot of Jewish people. They were saying like, well, if you are some Nazi stuff or some kind, we will support you. So he's like new, he says that he's a shoe now. He's in a process of transformation to be a, a shoe. But then when he went in the Vatican, he will go to uh, and say, no, I'm Catholic, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I have my convictions, but if you don't like, I have another, you know? <laughs> uh, but nowadays, he's like going to from here to a, from A to Z, like in a, in a second. Yeah, A to Z in a second. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's shift gears a little bit. I want to ask you how how are social movements responding to Millet? Like, what are what have what has been the role of anti fascists in the last couple of months in in responding to his his presidency and and what he's managed to get through Congress? Well, nowadays, for example, we as organization as an anti fascist organization, we obviously participate in all manifestation demonstrations. We also are making policy, politics formation about classism, about antifascist, about self-defense. Um, also, we're, we're training <laughs> to combat, but another social movement, they are organization, organizing a lot of stuff, a lot of talks, a lot of meetings, a lot of debates, just to be prepared for the worst, you know, for the, well, if they approve the laws, we have to go out the streets and do a mess, you know, it's going to be messy. Yeah. But um, also there are a lot of organizations that without the money of the state can't even work. There was a lot of parties or social or social organization that distribute the, the money that the state gives to them. So now when the state didn't give them more money, more money they, have, they haven't got the people because the people say, no, there's no money, there's no nothing. So that's a big problem because you can, you can see, for example, two years ago, three years ago, a uh, demonstration, a manifestation with, I don't know, for example, 5,000 people. And if you count them, like 300, where they even know why they were manifesting. Mm -hmm. The another people is like we you have to come to the manifestation because you are part of the organization because we give you money. So that's a problem for a lot of organization. I think I think that's something that should uh, have to happen because those organizations they are only managing the pureness, the, the the poverty, you know. They're not giving benefits, they're not giving work, they're not giving nothing. Just having a meeting with the social ministry, they say, well, I will give you uh, 500 um, coupons, 500 um, works, for example, or money, and then they take the third part of that and generate money to the people. Yeah. So it seems like these other organizations are are maybe not accompanying or they're not taking advantage of this moment to increase political education of, of kind of what they're <clears throat> doing. And maybe people are tagging along just, just because there's a crowd. Is that kind of what you were saying? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so we kind of talked. You kind of brought it up a little bit. I wanted to ask you about um, La Cultura del Barrio (LCDB). Um, yes. You said anti-fascists are training, and I was, I, you know, I, I've been to, I've been to the space, so I know a little bit. But I, I don't think that most anti-fascists in America know about LCDB. So, uh, yeah, 
why don't you why don't you talk a little bit about like what is LCDB? What are the boxing classes you guys are doing in the gym and out out in the barrio? And how what's what's the importance of LCDB in this new kind of state of you know anti labor reform? Okay. Well, uh, LCDB, as you say, is La Cultura del Barrio. It's an anti fascist club. We have a gym, a very big gym, with, where we train box and Muay Thai. Um, we have been, we are working since 2011. Yeah, 2010, 2011. As a space, as, as a place, you know, we used to have well meetings, trainings, uh, projection debates, gigs, um, karaoke. a lot of things. Yeah. So we also, as we have the space, we used to to send the people to meet them, to meet there with a lot of organization people so they can know us as we think, as we are. Antifascist, as, as I said before, we, we also train combat sports to be prepared. For example, for if we have to clash with against the police or a facet or whatever, but also we have, uh, for example, classes of uh, Marxism, anarchism, just to not be only muscles and not be only brain. You know, we have to be like a mix of all that. Here in Buenos Aires, we are very known because we we have a, a documentary. It's on uh, in internet, I think, which explain what we what we are, what we think. For example, we also coordinate with a lot of organizations to teach them about self defense, or organization organizing us the self defense of some manifestations, some demonstrations. Also, we we have a relation with another clubs from different uh, countries, but. We, as, as a club and as organization, anti-fascist, anti-fascist action, we try to be involved in in a lot of things, you know, different stuff. For example, we have a, a project in which we give people, uh, guys, classes of uh, box in a poor hood, poor neighborhood in the southern part of the province. No, in the, yeah, the south, uh, Buenos Aires. It's a very poor place, and we well, we train them box uh, uh, about politics. I talk a lot. We try to be involved with the families with their needs. Also, trying to work with different kind of artistic manifestations. But well, for example, if they're against uh, the new laws about job flexibility, etc. We we know that we the only way we have to we can combat that is in the streets, organize with another organization in the streets, but not only in the manifestation. Just because because we have to talk, for example, with the general people about politics, about how the new laws gonna gonna make us uh, purer than we are now. As uh, for example, if you are a uh, football supporter, you're going to lose your club and it's going to be a private company. Nowadays, it doesn't happen in Argentina. The clubs in Argentina, football clubs, are managed by their supporters, by their associates. And there are a lot of stuff like that with the, the new mega law, you know. I don't know. What, what else did you ask? I, yeah, I yeah. My no, I, it's all right. I asked you kind of a lot of questions. Um I think your response kind of led me to a, a different, another similar question that is related. Has there been reactionary violence towards the manifestations against Millet? Like from no, Millet supporters? Not now. But we think that's going to happen eventually. Uh, for example, the last manifestation, a, a lot of Millet supporters was saying, we're going to go to the street and we're going to fight the leftists and all of that. None of single one person appeared. I think most of the Malay supporters are social media supporters and they are tro- like trolls. Act and, uh, like, they act like that. They say you, they can say, you, I will call, I'm going to kill you if I see you in the street, but you can see them in the street because they are not in the streets. 
Um, so maybe it's gonna happen if if the left wing parties of the left wing organizations uh, have more became more combative. Nowadays they are also in social media. Most of the Millet against Millet discourse uh, are like the performances in TikTok, you know? Like, Millet, it's bad, Millet, and it's, oh, you're not gonna stop a, a lob to be singing in, the, in TikTok, you know? <laughs> Most of the things that the people support of Millet, instead of talking about the, the bad things of Millet, they're talking about the people like, no, Millet's gonna do that, and the people, yeah, I, we, I, gonna, I want to do that, <laughs> him to do that. Instead of saying, yeah, hey, you're gonna be poorer than now, you, your salary became like worse than now, but they are talking about anything else, but not the important things. Yeah. Not the economy things that is the, the more important because it's like, it's gonna affect all the people, yeah. not only the left people or the socialist people or anarchist people, they will affect all, all of us as, as a class, as a working class people. But uh, left wing, left parties here, they're not classist anymore. They talk about uh, everything, but not class. You're talking about the forest getting fired in Australia. They're talking about how, I don't know, how the people, how, not, I don't know. Now I don't remember uh, another, for example, the, they were against uh, minery, petro, uh, petrol uh, oil company etc. in a country that we have no we have no jobs and that for example a memory gives a lot of people their job and the money and they're against that but they say for example we have to close that that company but we can't we can support the the people lose their job it's, it's, it's incomp incompatible you know yeah if they're close the people are gonna get fired yeah so that's how it works. It's it sounds like what you're saying is that the the left has lost the class analysis, and that's driving yeah. driving some of the working working class people to feel alienated from the left. Yeah, they are more uh, in fire uh, identity politics. You know. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. So I had uh, I don't know if, I don't know if you can talk about this, but I saw I saw on social media that there was a a bomb threat to LCDB during the strike. Was that did I read that correctly? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was like uh, they called to the police that saying that do we have a bomb in the club. They said the bomb in the club the same day as we have a antifascist meeting there. So. As we think, it was done by a little kid calling the police, like, there's a bomb in the, that antifascist place, but the people, the police, the police came, knocked the door, we have to enter, the, the guys, I, I wasn't there that in that moment, the, uh, the guys just called to an, uh, a lawyer, a uh, known lawyer for us, and they say, well, you have to open the, <laughs> the, the door, or open the door because they it's not like um uh, it's not no not the when the the police uh looks look in your home looking for bombs for example or guns or yes. drugs or whatever it was nothing like that it was like we're gonna enter the squad bomb they enter looking with a lighter uh, there's nothing let's go just that but as we think, it's like a, a guy who calls the police and say that have to bother us, but nothing else yeah. for now. I hope. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So my oh, my last question for you, and this will be kind of niche, um, it'll, if, because the nature of how football is run in Argentina is very different than how it's run in the United States. So, for for example, football in the United States. All the clubs are owned by big corporations, um, big CEOs with a lot of money. Whereas traditionally in Argentina, as you said, it's it, the clubs are financially owned by the associates. So it's like the memberships of the clubs. So the people who go 
into the fill the stadiums and the terraces they you know have that ownership into the club in Argentina how has Mille tried to change that because I understand this is very big in Argentina but I don't think most yeah. Americans will understand this if for, uh, well as I said in project this big loan this GNU coming a in a part that now it will allow to the big companies to buy a team a football team a football club uh, not only football club for example a huge club are not only football they have volley handball basket and a lot of sports because the club here is like um part of the society they are you grow in the club in your club you go when you're a kid uh do a sport you meet uh, your friends you go to uh to have a dinner there or a, a dance in the club it's like a part of, of your life um with the new law as they will allow to big companies to buy the teams all the a lot of people saying well no we are the the owners of our club our colors our name uh, for example no one I, the biggest uh, team which goes into the manifestation where Boca Juniors is one of the best teams of Argentina, the biggest, I think. For example, they were the first that say, no, that's, it's impossible to happen because they have a lot of identity. The La Boca is their, their hood, the neighborhood. It's like you are going to the street, for, for, by the street, and it's all painted on the club colors, blue and yellow. The people feel their club like a, like a friend, you know? You stay with them, with the club, it, when it's bad and when it's good, when it's going fast and when it's going in the uh, descending, for example, it's you have to stay with him. Nowadays, a lot of clubs have f f financial problems. That's a big problem here because they try to buy some player to or uh, have a corrupt uh, dirigent and they they steal the money or a lot of stuff like that but no one will allow to sell their club because um here as i say you it's like part of your life but not as a as a thing that you pay to go to a gym and do some sports and then go to your to your house and you are not involved. The people here are involved making the, the banners, making, for example, human rights. Some clubs have human rights uh, parts. For example, they talk about the supporters died in the dead or disappeared in the last uh, dictatorship and they make memorials and they make um, recognition for the families or for example they they do uh dances or a lot of stuff to finance the people which don't can't pay for example education or whatever and they use their installation for example the big clubs here like river boca they have their own schools so the people who train the club mostly in the football teams they can uh, study there and and train there for, for because there are a lot of people that came from different states to play in Boca Juniors or River Independiente and they are allowed to sleep and to live there. They have like uh, hotels, uh, pensions, I don't know what to say. Yeah. But if they private, they give the the can the the clubs to the big corpor uh, corporations, the big companies, it will be a problem because all of that will disappear because it's not ridiculous you know you can earn money for the social the human rights uh, part of your club but and for example if you for example boca junior they then come red bull and buy boca and then they call boca red bull boca it's like they are they are killing you you know it's like you can can you can change my the name of my club because all the essence of my club is the name and the colors and the neighborhood yeah, and they maybe move the stadium from la boca to puerto madero because it's more you have more profits if you move the stadium um and it's it's, it's you know 
it's going to be the, the, the football, the little part of the non modern football that we have in Argentina, they will kill us. They will kill that. So football in Argentina is very much like a part of people's everyday lives in society in Argentina. It's not, it's not like, you know, like he's just opening up the finances for a sports team. Football, football here is like a religion. Yes. You know, the, the people say, the people, I think, you ask in the, in the street, a lot of people will say you that they are a chain, for example, but they are fanatics of a football team. And they live for that football team. I have a tattoo and have a, the names of their children are related to the to the football team. For example, a player or a whatever. Yeah. And our Jesus is Maradona. <laughs> <laughs> so I think all the people that support football, that are supported, have to to think what would Maradona do in this situation. Yes. Uh, Maradona would say, go f*** yourself. <laughs> the nothing for the people. Yes. Okay, Nico, that's all the questions I have. This has been really excellent. Thank you so much. Is there anything else? Thank you. you. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to touch on before, before I close out the interview? Great. If you need anything else, sorry for my bad English, but well, I have to practice. No, this was great. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Great to Take see you. Soon. I'll talk to you soon, Nico. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Kite Line is a weekly 30-minute radio program focusing on issues in the prison system. You'll hear news along with stories from prisoners and former prisoners as well as their loved ones. You'll learn what prison is, how it functions, and how it impacts all of us. Behind the prison walls, a message is called a kite. Whispered words, a note passed hand to hand, a request submitted to the guards for medical care. Illicit or not, sending a kite means trusting that other people will bear it farther along until it reaches its destination. Here on Kite Line, we hope to share these words across the prison walls. You can hear us on the Channel Zero Network and find out more at kitelineradio.noblogs.org. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. 53 people in the U.S. were killed in mass shootings in the month of August 2023. That same month, 130 people were killed by cops, according to an incomplete list compiled by the Washington Post. These are their names. Benjamin Pickens, Alfred Chantez Cole, Elaine Marie Hellman, Rodney D. Hellman, Anthony John Gardner, Nathan J. Breeze, Andrew David Massey, Nikendrion Pride, Christian Felipe Johnson, Gary Dwayne Harrell, James Monty, Benjamin Rivers, Sean Haddock, Kyle Easties, Marquise Rivera, Larry Douglas Odin II, Tahiem Weeks Cook, Julio Alberto Cifuentes, name withheld, August 4th, New York, New York, Brandon Lee Cole, Dayton Shamandria Veal, Zachary Logan Bryson, Larry D. Dunham, Jason Hampton, Shannon Wayne Marshall, Juan Leonard Johnson, Darren Shaw, Daniel R. Legler, David Keith Algorin Jr., Renardo Carballo Morales, Arturo Cernas, Michael Ruzicki, Corey Wayne Thomas, Gilberto Sotelo, Anthony Tovar, Mike Alexander Garcia, Charles Rice, Jesse Lewis Nichols, Daryl Sosia, Cody Cusior, Ahmad Nassar, Kivion Martez Jones, Austin Page Hunsinger, Daniel Mark Smith, Craig DeLu Robertson, Giovanni McNabb, Jonathan Heath Taylor, 
Sean G. Sheridan. Kevin Walter Withrow. Michael Antoine Greer. Johnny Holman. Name withheld, August 11th, San Bernardino, California. Louis C. Gordon Hay. Roger Sylvester Hurd, Jr. Name withheld, August 11th, Mesquite, Texas. Eric Blaschick. Bradley Robert Van Heeswick. Thomas C. Baskin. Matthew Bigler. Corey James Unti. Olban Perdomo Rodas. Timothy Craig Setzer, Jr. Eddie Jose Irasari, John Andreo, Zachary Joseph Johnson, Chad Pike, Pedro Lopez, Tracy Jaliz Marie Blunt, Brandon Jamar Hill, Alejandro Diaz, Richard Glass, Dante Day, Javier Benjamin Lacosta, J. Allen Clarenbal, Javier Lena Zavala, Adam Michael Trejo, Leonard Green, Brandon Green, Theodore Deschler, Benjamin Arthur Anaboli. Name withheld, August 18th, Detroit, Michigan. Travis Ikaguchi. Tamon Kenneth Wilson, Jaquan Keontae Fletcher, William Brent Gilmore, Peter Evan Corey, Jonathan James Stroud, Don Robert Astor, John Snowling, Juan de Jesus Rodriguez Godinez, Kairi V. Myers, Andrew James Marlowe, Eric Dupre, James David Overstreet, William Hardison Sr., Joseph Michael Rothka, Aaron Lee Zimmerman, Jason Taylor Bowles, Takia Monet Yvette Young, Nathaniel Evans, Javion Barthel, Anthony Richard Field II, Christopher Ralph Dodge, Demetrius J. Robinson, Trinity Scott Deese, Sandra Lopez Ochoa, Corey Andrew, Randall Fife, Casey J. Barlow, Nolan Ray, name withheld, August 26th, Eville, Texas. Angel Ledesma, Kendall Darnell Gilbert, Andrew Jerome Washington, Victor Cabrera Francisco, Carlos A. Perez Gaetan, Thomas Michael Carney, Jesse Glenn Nelson, Paul Holland, Bernie Breeding, Nathan Grice, Demarcus Williams, Jordan Cannon, Michael Kirkland, Victor Andres Fernandez, Berkeley Lee Collins Jr., Richard Jess Ramirez, Alessandro Vargas, Tremaine Jackson. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A243205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road, Youngstown, Ohio 44505. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. 
This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. Programming support is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm is a bookstore and social movement space owned by its workers in operation since 2008. Their event calendar and complete catalog of books can be found online at firestorm.coop.